Okay, and here we go. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our May Hot Topics. This will be our last Hot Topics for this year until next September. So we're really glad that you could make it. Uh, the League is um, always open to new members. If, none of, if some of you are not members yet, we would love to have you join us. And um, we, you know, are nonpartisan, but we do, of course, uh, support issues and we study issues and we support them and we advocate for them. And so this session, this hot topics tonight is about our advocacy work. And um, during our speakers are going to be speaking and Trish Neely will be introducing them in just a minute. But we wanna make sure that we leave time for questions. So uh, you can use the chat box for questions. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll take those questions via chat. So that being said, I want to introduce Trish Neely. Trish serves as our Lobby Corps chair. And the Lobby Corps is a really important part of the, of the state league because we're here in Tallahassee and we are able to advocate for the issues that the league um, watches and monitors. And this year has been exceedingly uh, challenging because of COVID. And usually we have a whole cadre of people that go up to the Capitol and are able to uh, sit there and wave and wear our buttons and speak at times. But this year that's really been impossible. So the huge burden to do it all has fallen on Trish Neely. She has spent day after day up at the Civic Center because they had the Capitol pretty much closed off. They made it extremely difficult for citizens to participate, but somehow Trish Neely, she got through it all. She stood there and uh, spoke truth to power and we're so proud of what she's done. So I'm going to turn the, the program over now to Trish Neely and she's going to introduce our speakers and talk a little about the program. So Trish, take it okay. away. All right, well, thank you, Sally. And again, thank you to everybody who's, um, who's signed on. I'm going to be tag teaming with um, Dr. Jeff Sharkey and Lauren Gallo to round up some of our key priority issues and just give you an idea of how they fared in the 2021 uh, Florida legislature. At 3.30 this afternoon, if you haven't checked your emails yet, the uh, final capital report was sent out by the State League, um, and it includes um, a written overview of, um, of what actually happened this session with, with our particular issues. And we're gonna be covering some of the same ground. We'll speak for about 30 minutes, 30, maybe 40 minutes, and then we're gonna give you plenty of time to ask questions. And as Sally said, if you wanna put your question in the, um, in the chat box, I'll be monitoring those. Um, and, or you can, just, you can just wait until the end. So as a reminder, and maybe some of you are new to the league, um, our 2021 priorities fell into four categories. We had election law, that's always one of our priorities. Then we had education, healthcare, natural and um, natural resources. And then in addition to whatever we identify as our priorities for the year, we always monitor any bills that are of significant impact uh, to the league's mission or values. And this year, um, as three examples, uh, there were a number of home rule bills. Um, the league is totally against preemption. Um, there were several gun control bills, and then there was uh, one, a bill that turned out to be one of our major priorities that I know Jeff and Lauren will talk about on First Amendment rights. So if we don't cover something um, as, as part of our presentation, um, something that you're interested in, just as I said, just post it in the chat box. Um, I've got a few shout outs. Um, th thank you for your kind remarks, Sally. But I have a few shout outs as well. Um, first to our statewide issue chairs, and I don't know if Kathy wins on here or not, but she ha is, has just become one of our statewide issue chairs. Um, these men and women are absolutely wonderful. They stay on top of all the bills, the amendments, and they provide the current talking points to those of us who um, speak for the league at either committee meetings or press conferences. 
And then our, um, our state fearless leader, uh, my very dear friend, Patty Brigham, for being one of the best um, herder of cats, I guess I, I, I would say. She kept uh, last year as well as this year, she kept the advocacy process really laser focused, which is something that we absolutely have to have, particularly the, this, this, um, this recent session just because of COVID, COVID and our limited access. Um, and then members of Lobby Corps, I know there are quite a few of you who are on here, thank you. Um, I really wanna shout out to those of you who testified in committee, attended press conferences for us, stood in solidarity with some of our coalition partners on key issues, and then um, phoned and made multiple emails to various legislators uh, in response to our, to our action alerts. That is an invaluable process. I know it seems like it's not as important as what some of us do in, um, in the session, but I assure you it's extremely important. And then of course, um, Jeff and Lauren, this is my second year working uh, with both of you. And um, uh, the, relations, the relationships that you have with the top policy makers and just your general knowledge and insight into the political process has been of great benefit to me as, as well as to the league. Um, most of you know that our issues um, our positions are not that popular on, on, uh, at the Capitol. Um, and Capitol Alliance Group, uh, their incredible value to the league is their insight into the legislative uh, drivers. For example, what, what are the, what's the governor um, and his cabinet or the legislators, what is their agenda? So they help provide in, in, insight into that and then um, they help position the league's message so that it's received uh, more favorably to, to those who look upon us rather skeptically because um, we have an alternate view to theirs. Um, so, um, so we're gonna be talking about some of the bills. And as I said, we're gonna do a tag team. So um, Jeff and Lauren and I are, are gonna probably be bouncing around. Hopefully we won't talk over one another. Um, but uh, we'll talk about some of the key bills, the challenges um, that we face, opportunities, and then what the final outcomes were. So with that, Jeff, I'm gonna let you kick it off. Um, go on, uh, you're still on mute. That's the way my wife likes me, frankly, most of the time. I was <laughs> <laughs> Listen, thank you, Trish and Sally. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction. and. Um, again, we're, we're, we're pleased to uh, represent the League of Women Voters. Uh, Lauren Gallo's on the, on, the, on the Zoom with us here. Lauren and I are gonna tag team as well on going through um, some of the bills that are included in the uh, kind of end of session capital report. <clears throat> but so let me just make a couple of comments to start. <clears throat> I know we've only got 30 minutes, but this has been a, you know, a really challenging year for the policy priorities for the League, as you know, coming off the uh, 2020 election, uh, there are still today even some, you know, some tremendous doubt about the, the veracity of the election, who the president is, and, and there is a national, uh, uh, virus is probably the wrong word, but a policy virus that has swept the country that, uh, that has uh, contributed to filing a number of bills here, some of which we'll go through, um, that many states uh, experienced as well, that are to some extent an attempt to try to to try to um, uh, address what some uh, folks in certain parties believe um, were problems with the election. So one of the things that's important for us, I know as Trish pointed out, you know, our goal is to make the league smarter, better, build your, build your brand stronger, and to be credible and taken seriously and professionally with uh, legislators. Um, and I think that collectively as a team, we've done that over the last two years. Um, Many of your positions do, you know, do rankle certain people. Uh, that, but um, I think you, you've spoken truth to power, as, as, um, as Sally mentioned. The entire team, your issue chairs and your staff, have uh, been really uh, uh, enjoyable to work with because, you know, in this process, conviction and principle, you know, uh, trumps 
the wrong term, but trumps everything. Really. So, uh, but let me just kind of tick through just really quickly. <clears throat> One of the kind of the big issue, obviously, is COVID. The, 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 the Capitol was closed, as, as Trish pointed out. You had to go to the Civic Center to, to come and make testimony on the Senate side. The House had a little bit more open process, but it was very challenging. No stakeholder involvement, frankly, uh, interaction. Uh, so there was COVID. <clears throat> and then, of course, the huge impact on the budget that was anticipated because of COVID. Um, last year, we had a budget of $91 billion. Uh, in in um, uh, January, there was an assumption that we were going to be $2 billion to $3 billion short. Uh, so all the budget uh, considerations were, as they were being developed were considering that. Um, at the end of the day, with the American Rescue Plan, with $10.2 billion coming down from the feds, uh, the, the uh, legislature passed a $101.2 billion budget. That's $10 billion more than last year. Um, and that includes a lot of stuff that I think we, we care about, um, that uh, you know, 100 million for cleanup of the Piney Point uh, phosphate uh, uh, problem, uh, 750 million for, for public construction projects at schools, um, Medicaid rolls, $209 million in recurring funding for the Sadowski, um, funds, which I think, even though it's not full funding, it's, a, I think, a very positive statement. So we, um, the budget had a big impact. And, and I think at the end of the day, uh, it helped fund a number of programs that uh, I think potentially were going to be cut. Um, Lauren, you want to just jump in here for the, uh, for the Medicaid issue and Florida Forever? Yeah, so lawmakers found $239.8 million to extend Medicaid this year which was nice. And then due to federal infusion, legislators appropriate 500 million for teachers pay, which increases at 3% across the board. And then another additional 100 million for Florida Forever and 650 million for water in Everglades. <coughs> Fully funding Visit Florida and the Sadowski Trust Fund. Yeah. So um, I will jump into these bills. I just want to let you know. So as Trish knows, because she was kind of on the firing line up here, you know, there are, for those of you who kind of don't participate in, at the Capitol during the legislative session, there were 3,140 bills filed. That's a lot of pieces of legislation and only 270 bills passed. Some of them, some of them <laughs> good bills, some of them not so good bills. So that process over the course of four months is really what we in the league are trying to do to ensure that we can we can um, uh, stop the bills that are bad and amend the ones that are really you know to, to be a little bit better and and uh, and potentially pass ones that we like. So as um, as um, uh, Trish pointed out, you know we do take your priorities. Uh, we we're going to talk a little bit about the process and then we're going to jump into these bills. So Lauren, you want to just talk about how we did how we how we manage uh, and work with the league in terms of uh, those bills moving forward. Yes. So um, every during legislative session, every Friday, we have calls with all of the issue chairs. So Trish is on, Leah Nash, Blake Summerlin, obviously Patty Brigham is on. So we get together and we all talk about every <coughs> single bill that we may have an issue with this year. In the past couple of the past two years that we have worked for the league, we've kind of tried very hard to kind of rein in our issues. Since we are the League of Women Voters, we focused heavily this year on all of the election bills that came down the pipe. We also took a very deep dive into House Bill 1, which was the anti-riot legislation that, as we all know, is, was not great at all. And, you know, Trish did amazing this year. She was at the Civic Center, I think, more than I was at the Civic Center. And she was quoted in many different articles. She's been fabulous. We had Cecile Schoon who also was a great help for HB1 and helping us really, you know, figure out exactly what was going to be impacted, how it was going to be, you know, how people of Florida were going to be impacted and things like that. I think. So let's, let's talk about, let's talk about one of our, our kind of top priority bills. So as, as Lauren mentioned, and, and Trish, you can jump in here. You know, the first bill really out of the hopper was the governor's number one priority, which was the HB1 combating public disorder anti-riot bill. Um, that popped up really early. The House and the Senate uh, adopted it very early. Um, and as you, as you know, that bill would, you know, from our perspective, would hinder the right to peacefully protest and force harder punishments for people who are in violation of this new law. We got on the phone very early with the League's team, Patty, 
and Trish and, uh, and Cecile and Peggy Quince, Justice Quince, with the bill sponsor, uh, Representative Fernandez Barkeen, early on. And we said, listen, let, let's just kind of walk through this and, and explain why, the, why, you know, why this bill is a problem specifically. And, and uh, we did a very, very good job, I think. He, he listened intently, uh, was very amenable. Obviously not much changed, although the bill did, did move forward. But um, let me just kind of hit a couple of you know, key points. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but <clears throat> it, um, you know, it basically HB1 uh, allows prosecutors and local officials to appeal if a state, if a municipality tries to cut its police budget. That was, that was a big issue. It makes battery uh, on a law enforcement officer in furtherance of a riot or an aggravated riot, riot punishable by six months in prison, which is crazy. Um, pulling down a memorial uh, or historic property would be a second degree felony. Um, it makes it a third degree felony to participate in a riot, which you know, we all had difficulty trying to, to define, uh, which is defined as three or more people acting in common to assist each other in violent and disorderly conduct. Um, this, you know, this bill took a, got, got a lot of pushback from a lot of different groups. Uh, the Democrats in the House were very strongly opposed. At the end of the day, the bill did pass. The governor signed it immediately. Uh, that is a big, that bill uh, is going to have serious repercussions. Obviously, I think it was targeted to not so much the January 6th uh, Capitol insurrection, but uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, issues, which you know, in really in Florida, there were very, very few, if any, uh, real concerns related to the bill. Trish, do you want to comment at all on that? Or? Yeah, um, a couple of things. Um, I thought it was interesting that um, the, 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 um, the Republicans who were sponsoring it and others who were also supporting it um, were making a big deal about saying that it had really had nothing to do with Black Lives Matter. It was, it was all about June the 6th. But interestingly, when the governor signed it, he said, oh, well, you know, this is all about the Black Lives Matter because we can't have any of that in Florida. So I, I, I thought that was interesting. But the other thing that I just wanted to mention, so I think it was signed on it, was it on a Wednesday? Something like that. And then um, on Thursday, um, I, I was at a press conference and I wasn't speaking, uh, Cecile Schoon was, was speaking and there were a bunch of, a uh, bunch of ministers, um, I can't remember what some of the other organizations were, I know the NAACP was there, National Organization for Women, um, it, it was a, it was a pretty diverse group, there weren't many of us but definitely diverse, and um, before the cameras even got turned on, we looked up and here comes Capitol Police with a dog, um, came right up to us, you know, meandered around and then went off to the other side. And I just remember all of us saying, so, well, the uh, anti-riot bill has been signed. So um, this is what a lot of people can expect, you know, to, ha to have happen, so. Um, I, I just found it so, I found that whole bill discouraging. I just hate that it yeah. passed. Yeah, certainly an overreaction, extremely. Um, let me move on to the next bill. I know Sally, uh, you can chat a little bit about this. She had a great op-ed in the Tallahassee Democrat uh, yesterday, I think it was. This was on uh, Senate Bill 48 and House Bill 7045, the Educational Scholarship Program, the Charter School Private Voucher Program. Um, a lot of the bill really focuses on um, on kind of consolidating and rearranging and revising um, the um, the Gardner Scholarship Program and um, uh, the McKay Scholarship Program, which which relate to students with disabilities. Uh, but again, it also it also does uh, it changes some of the current legislative requirements for the Florida Tax Credit Scholarship Program. Um, and I can go through uh, on, the, on, the, on the Gardner and McKay stuff. I don't there's, there's a lot of detail there in terms of, of who would qualify, what the income levels would be for, for students. It does expand the cap on the number of, of uh, students eligible. It transfers a lot of these disability scholarships into the, um, uh, uh, the Family Empowerment Scholarship Program. I know there's about five or six different acronyms, <coughs> programs. Um, so that's an attempt to kind of consolidate some of the, some of those particular programs. 
Uh, it does a couple of other things, and, and Sally, I'm sure you want to, want to chime in here, but uh, for those of you who are familiar with, you know, uh, uh, Step Up Florida and the Florida Tax Credit Program, a scholarship program, uh, this does a couple of things. It really um, uh, increases the federal poverty level, uh, who qualifies. I mean, the, the amount of money this program gets, which is a dollar for dollar uh, uh, discount, uh, credit off your of your income taxes is, is stunning. Uh, so it increases the income level, poverty income for eligible students from 260% to 375%. More students would qualify. Um, it increases the scholarship amount <clears throat> and it, um, it allows uh, these uh, programs like Step Up uh, to increase their administrative fees from 1% to 2.5%, as well as their uh, the the amount of when when they have to file for an audit from every year to three years, uh, which uh, and I think uh, Sally, you may want to chime in here. Um, there have been there have been clearly identified issues and problems with the implementation and the administration of these programs. So um, this is a you know the charter school issues are a big issue for Republicans in the House and the Senate. Um, this was fought by Democrats along the way. For a variety of reasons, um, it's interesting. There's a lot of folks in the, in the Black Caucus who support charter schools, obviously, but um, <clears throat> in some instances here, they did uh, some of the some of the programs that are administered. Uh, they are uh, they have some ser serious concerns about. Sally, do you want to you want to chat about this at all? Sally, unmute. Okay. Um, yes, the. Uh, the vouchers isn't even, that's in addition to the charter school issue. But um, this, this, what I wrote about was Step Up for Students and our league did a, a very thorough report about Step Up because what caught my attention every year when I would go to, up to the legislature, there would be these busloads of cute little black kids that would come up and be lobbying for their private schools. And I think that's one of the reasons a lot of the black legislators are torn because a lot of the these black churches are opening uh, little private schools and they of course benefit from this greatly. But uh, read our report, it's on the league's uh, Florida website. But the other thing that people didn't don't understand about this legislation is that once in, always in. So now a family with $100,000 income qualifies for a so-called scholarship. And once you're, if your child gets in in kindergarten even if your income goes up, you know, substantially, you still will get a taxpayer credit <clears throat> scholarship for the rest of your child's career. Plus the legislation also allows you to save anything you don't spend for a college uh, fund. So taxpayers are subsidizing something that's very questionable. And as you know, our objection is public schools are the foundation of democracy. And, and the uh, clear intent of this is to go to a completely choice uh, school system with no standards and all, the only ones that can decide what's right and wrong are the parents. And we all know that a lot of parents don't make real good decisions and there's a lot of uh, being, people being bamboozled <laughs> into thinking they're at a good school and come to find out the kids really aren't learning anything. And how do we know they don't have to take the state test? Right. There's no certified <clears throat> teachers required and so on and so on. But read our report. As you can see, I'm passionate about it. And I'm sorry that it passed, but apparently there were some things that were um, right. mitigated a little bit, but it's still a really bad yeah. bill. And it's <clears throat> gonna get worse every year. Their goal <clears throat> is to have the whole system go to a totally parent-driven system. And they've said that many times. Correct, correct. Thank you, Sally. Um, Lauren, do you want to jump into the next bills, a uh, uh, couple of bills here? Yes. So the next one is House Bill 61, which is percentage of elector, elector votes required to approve constitutional amendments or revisions. And basically, so this bill ultimately died, but it would have proposed amendments to the state constitution to increase percentage of electoral votes required to approve an, amend an amendment or revise the state constitution. So currently we're at 60%. It would increase that to 66% and two thirds percent. 
So you know, I was actually, I watched this during committee. We had a bunch of amendments come down from a lot of Dems that would have basically said, well, if we're going to make the Florida, you know, the citizens of Florida abide by this, why don't, you know, the Florida legislator also amends the Florida constitution. Why don't we also need 66%? So I thought that was a great point. I actually believe Senator Pol Polsky brought forth that amendment. So that was a great committee to hear because, I mean, she just kind of like proved that point and they were all like, well, no, we're not going to take on that responsibility too. We just think that we should make, you know, the citizens of Florida have to do that 66%. So it ultimately died on second reading in the House and the Senate companion died in the Rules Committee. Um, the next one is Senate Bill 86, Student Financial Aid by Senator Baxley. This was a huge controversial bill. I actually testified for it in the Civic Center. This would have um, reduced um, the amount of money you would get through Bright Futures. And it would also, so you, it would take all of the majors and basically they were going to have this committee and they were going to say which ones were like more, you were more likely to get a job from when you graduated. So your arts probably weren't going to get that much money because they were deemed not as successful once you graduate to get a job. But obviously your law degrees, your medical degrees, all of those would still get more funding, which we actually had a huge uproar with students across the state and testified. I think in the first committee hearing, there were over, I want to say 80 students. It took, I think, about all day for them to get through this committee hearing to the point where it was 15 seconds for your testimony. Ultimately, Senator Baxley did end up taking out those huge, so he ended up still being able to fully fund Bright Futures. There was a huge delete all in this bill. And so it took out, kind of like gutted the whole entire thing. He still left in that they would create a system that would basically allow students to log on to this website and see which degrees would be able to get a job after school. But so, it, I mean, it, it made some changes. It wasn't the greatest. It did go to the Senate floor. It did pass off the Senate floor, but it ultimately died in messaging. So the House didn't really have an appetite for it, thankfully. So I think that is all. Yeah, <clears throat> that's good. That, that was an absolutely terrible bill. I actually, um, what, when, uh, when Lauren testified for the league, I uh, took off my buttons and testified for my four grandchildren who are all Bright Futures recipients because they were just absolutely outraged as were my kids. Yeah, <clears throat> my, my 18 year old son was, uh, was, was out, out, outraged. He was gonna come down as well, but. <laughs> um, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, it really was designed to cut bright futures if you were if you're pursuing a degree that potentially would not be as uh, as employable, uh, which was like super very difficult to to decipher and determine. So anyway, uh, um, I'm not sure that bill will be back. He just took a lot of heat on that bill. So so let's move forward. I know we're we're running a little bit short on time, but the the next big one, uh, which is Patricia's favorite, uh, Senate Bill 90. Uh, election administration. This obviously for the league was right at the heart of the things you know we care about the most. This is by Senator Baxley. It, it did pass and was signed by the governor. Um, you know this is this this bill on quote unquote election reform. You know is, is I mentioned before as part of a you know, Republican led effort nationwide to restrict voting access at state level. Um, I, I notice here you know the, the Brennan Center for Justice New York found that 361 bills have been filed uh, in 47 states, very similar to try to restrict voting after the election of last November, which is remarkable. And I think as and Trish uh, was, uh, was a yo person and testifying on this, we, we spent a lot of time on this bill as did you know, league members. Um, it, does, it does a lot of things um, that were very challenging. It started out extremely bad. It got a little less bad. Uh, through an amendment in the Senate towards the end, uh, but and it, and it and it's and it certainly does affect um, a whole range of things. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tick through all of them, but you know, some some critical things here are, you know the you know for like vote by mail ballots, um, uh, you know the uh, you, you no longer can you you know you you, you get if you request a vote by mail ballot that used to be good for two years now they're really only good for the next election. Um, uh, they required new information to request that vote by mail ballot. 
the whole issue, the whole bill is really focused on, to a large extent, vote by mail and, and ballot drop boxes um, and, you know, some significant problems. So let me just tick through a couple of them. Um, particularly for, for some reason for drop boxes, which, you know, the bill sponsor and others <clears throat> felt were a critical problem in terms of safety and security of elections. So um, they, they now require in this bill that all drop boxes have to be monitored by a supervisor of election employee. They have to be geographically located, you know, across the community. They can't be in certain areas designated arbitrarily by the supervisor. Um, they, um, uh, they have, to, have to be monitored. You can't stand within 150 feet of them. You can't solicit next to them. Um, they have to be uh, collected every day. Um, the ballots have to be collected from the box every day. They can only be open during early voting periods. The time the early voting uh, period um, is in place. Um, it's, uh, it's remarkable. Um, so um, there are some additional criminal penalties for um, uh, for vote by mail ballots to, to correspond to the attestation that's required in this law. And um, um, there's a whole series of issues about um, what kind of private funds can be used, um, what roles for poll watchers, et cetera. Um, it's overall just a, just a really terrible bill. And I think what's remarkable is that for years, Republican, and I'm, again, I'm gonna try to be nonpartisan here, but for years, Republicans really dominated vote by mail ballots and absentee ballots. And because of the last election, they're turning 180 degrees and suggesting that there are significant problems with it and uh, going to try to restrict it. Trish, um, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll just say that um, if you don't know, uh, within minutes after signing it, the league filed uh, a complaint um, along with um, we were joined with Black Voters Matter, the Florida <clears throat> Alliance for Retired People, and then there were several individual uh, handicapped voters that, that were also part of our lawsuit. I don't think there was anything um, at the Capitol that I testified more on or did more press releases for. <clears throat> or, um, I, I mean, it's, it's just absolutely a, a terrible bill. Yeah. Um, and so right now there are four lawsuits in total. So right. ours was the first, then the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund and Common Cause filed, um, the League of United Latin American Citizens filed, and the last one that I heard about was Florida Rising Together, Faith in Florida, um, Unidos US Equal Ground Education Fund and the Hispanic Federation. And our issues are all pretty much the same. And, um, and, and Jeff ticked them all off. So you know yeah. that um, this will have a, the, the, the new requirements in this will, will have a, a, um, just a terrible impact on people that, that already have a hard time uh, getting sure. to the voting box. And um, so that's why, that's why we were opposed yeah. and that's why we're filing a complaint. Yeah. So, um, Stay tuned on the complaint because this is uh, this is something that the league is going to be working on for the next year or two or however long it takes, um, along with with all of these other folks. You know, it's remarkable, uh, Trish, and I know you know this as do the league members. You know, the supervisors of elections were opposed to this bill. Yeah. These Every are the people who run the elections. They you know they, they they care about security, they care about safety, they care about access, they care about fairness, and throughout this entire process. Um, uh, they, they said, this is, this is not something we asked for. This is not something we think is necessary. And continually, Bill Sponsor and other supporters kept saying, well, we may not have had a problem in Florida during the last election, which was heralded as you know, perfectly well run. But um, uh, this is in case something happens in the future, which is uh, remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, in, ca in case uh, maybe more Democrats come out again yeah, yeah, or try to. Um, sorry yeah. for, for being partisan there for a second, but yeah. it is yeah. frustrating. Laura, do you want to take the next couple? Yes. So the next one, I believe, is House Bill 241. This is the Parents' Bill of Rights by Representative Grawl. This did pass both the House and the Senate and 
basically what this bill is going to do is it's going to um, provide like a, a bunch of different rights that parents will have in like a school mm -hmm. system. So they're going to, they're now going to have more of a list in their um, child's education. So if they, they'll get a list of like what they're going to, their curriculum, what they will be taught in class. And if they deem that they don't want their kid to be learning a certain subject, let's say like it's like sex ed or something like that, <laughs> they can require that their kid not sit in the class during that time and they don't want them to be taught. It also is just going to give parents more of a right when it comes to their health care. So they have to sign off anytime a healthcare practitioner wants to give treatment to their child. And then this bill will also may provide a misdemeanor penalty penalty for healthcare practitioners or similar persons who violate the healthcare provisions and subjects these persons to dis and then it'll give them disciplinary actions. So obviously if they don't, you know, follow these rules that are written out in this bill, there are going to be consequences. Um, this was, it will, it's not signed by the governor yet. It's still waiting to be signed. Um, I think that's a good overview. Yeah, yeah, Lauren, can I just comment on that, which, which is remarkable, which, you know, began to permeate everything towards the middle and end of the session is, is the governor, is the governor is trying to open up the state, you know, uh, to, to open up businesses up again, kind of dismiss uh, CDC guidelines. And there's a lot in this bill that really is about prohibiting and restricting schools from providing really vaccination services, COVID services, healthcare, you know, guidance services, mask, you know, uh, uh, requirements, uh, which is remarkable. You know, I mean, and, uh, when you consider the impact that COVID had and the number of deaths in Florida. So, I mean, it, it's um, it's uh, one more instance of, of this instance where it's almost like a preemption uh, effort to, where the legislature thought that local governments and school districts were gonna be trying too much to try to protect people from COVID. Yes. Yes, and a lot of this stuff, I feel like, you know, parents should have the right <laughs> to know what their child's doing healthcare wise and stuff like that. So I just feel like they wanted to make a bill, put it into law. But the next one is, this is another one of mine and Trish's favorites, is House Bill 259, Safety of Religious Institutions by Representative Williamson. Um, Senator Gruders had the companion of this bill in the Senate. We actually had the chance to sit down with Senator Pizzo during session. I think it was me. I think Trish was on the call, Jeff, Patty, we all sat down with him and we talked about this bill. He actually proposed a couple of amendments. So back, I wanna say in either, maybe it was 2016 election, 2017, I could be getting that wrong. They had this exact same version of this bill come beforehand and they put an amendment on it that basically would, I think it would say, it would carve out school systems and stuff like that. So he brought forth this amendment and it was supported by uh, Marion Hammer, who is the NRA, lobbyist brought back the exact same amendment of the same version that this bill passed on the floor a couple years ago was ultimately told well we don't need it this year marion hammer did come out during <laughs> and said we oppose this even though years ago she was in support of this amendment so i thought that was very interesting this is basically allowing churches to have the right to um conceal carry <sighs> all church properties. This would also open up if a school um, houses a church, like if they have on Sundays and they rent out their auditorium to churches, this allows those churches to allow their patrons to conceal carry on the campus, which we thought was, that was kind of our big concern with this bill was we don't want to have, you know, armed weapons around children. That's something that I don't think anybody wants to happen. I mean, we've seen numerous times what guns do when they are brought on school campuses. And so that's really what the league kind of pushed forward on this one. Um, a lot of the churches weren't in favor of this as well. They kind of came out and said, you know, we don't want the responsibility to have to take this on. Um, it's, let's see what else. Jeff, do you have anything to add? No, I think that's good. I, and and <clears throat> seeing what seeing the time frame here, I'm going to kind of jump ahead a little bit. We <clears throat> we're going to talk about on the criminal justice side, the um, House Senate Bill 354, restitution for juvenile uh, delinquents, and uh, which I think helped uh, help revise I think positively 
um, the uh, the restitution valuation for for juveniles. I think that's pretty positive. The preemption on uh, HB eight thirty nine of fuel retail fuel retailers. This is a goofy bill or over some over some gas stations who didn't want to be um, you know, trying to provide alternative fuel options for for drivers. This bill prohibits gas stations really from um, providing um, uh, alternative fuel sources um, or having local governments tell them they can they have to provide alternative fuel sources. Um, that was that was a remarkably ridiculous bill. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the dissolution of marriage and, uh, and campaign financing to kind of uh, wrap this up and then open it up for uh, and then the last one, we'll just talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the, the transgender athlete, athlete bill. So um, Senate Bill 1922, dissolution of marriage. This ultimately um, did not pass. It got held up in the Senate. Uh, I do not believe, I don't know how far it got in the, the House. It died in Rules Committee. This would take away the permanent alimony um, that you would get in a divorce settlement. Um, it would also... <laughs> That was the huge part of it was really ultimately the alimony. Yeah. A lot of people had a problem since yeah. time all continue to go. The next, oh, I guess the next one I'll touch on and I'll let Jeff handle the last one would be Senate Bill 1028. This is the education bill by Senator Hudson. The big part about this bill was at the one of the, you know, like the last hours they attached the transgender bill which would prohibit trans women from participating in school sports. So your middle school children and your high school children, if you were assigned um, male at birth, you are no longer allowed to participate in sports in your um, middle school and your high schools. You have to provide, <laughs> um, when you go to play, you have to provide a birth certificate. And there was kind of a, there was kind of a, a a mix up with like how that was exactly going to work because what if you didn't have it was a, an original birth certificate so let's say that I didn't have my original birth certificate anymore because I lost it and I had to go get amended so that was a huge thing but this was probably one of the worst bills I saw this session it was it caused a lot of tears on the floor it was very heartbreaking so I'll let Jeff the last one we have. yeah Another, let me talk just briefly about Senate Bill 1890, campaign financing by Senator Rodriguez. This really, this bill really has three pieces to it. I'll keep it very quickly. It was really called the John Morgan uh, bill. As you know, John Morgan has funded a number of citizen initiative petitions. This does, one of the things it does is it limits the amount of uh, uh, campaign contributions by any individual entity uh, to $3,000 uh, for these citizens initiatives. And you know, Mr. Morgan, funded the marijuana initiative, the, the $15 an hour wage initiative with millions and millions of dollars. That's, um, so this was targeted to him. I talked to, talked to John, he's a friend of mine. He's, um, uh, he is uh, ready to uh, go to war over uh, this issue for sure. The other thing it does is it really uh, preempts local governments from enacting any ordinance that would limit campaign contributions uh, other than those set in state law. So if you, for example, Sally Tallahassee, we work in the city of St. Pete, they have some you know, limits of $500 and or $250 per, uh, per hard campaign contribution to a candidate. Um, this would uh, re remove that local ordinance, prohibit them from using that. And then the limits now go up to $1,000. So <clears throat> maybe good for candidates, but it's not good if you wanna kind of limit uh, the amount of money that's going in from in, any individual into campaigns. And then it, uh, and it provides some alternative methods for disposing of sur surplus campaign funds. This bill did pass and was signed already. Um, and so, you know, we, we think that's, that's obviously a problem. Why don't we stop there and-, and let, me, uh, let me just, let me add something to that, Jeff. So um, at, this, at the state board, we considered um, filing a suit against this, um, but, uh, having to do with the three thousand dollars because um, we we do have citizen initiatives we do help with those but we decided at the last minute that we really didn't have enough standing to be able to file but I can tell you that the ACLU has filed suit against this so with that um, let me see so um, 
Sally, Sally wanted to know, um, did teachers get the $1,000 bonus? They did. So the House and the Senate agreed to that $1,000 bonus. I believe it was also for like any first responders. So police officers and all that, they all got that $1,000, which came from the COVID-19 relief fund that we got from the American Rescue Plan. And then um, Sally's other question is, <laughs> um, when is Senator Baxley going to term yeah. it out? <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> I could tell, um, 2026, so not soon enough. <laughs> uh, darn. <laughs> okay, does anybody else have any, um, have any questions? If you, um, if you want to unmute and show your, show your face, we can see you, raise your hand. Um, anything else? Hmm? I don't see anything. Jeff, let me ask you a question. What, what, do you, what do you see for next year? Is it too soon? No, I think a number of bills that didn't pass will be back. Obviously, that's always typically the, you know, what we can expect. Um, you know, some, some of it depends on um, the, 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 obviously, with, if, the, this American Rescue Plan funding is a one-year uh, you know, in, in influx of, of capital, they put away about six billion of that. So I, mean, I, I don't know, if, you know, budget considerations will be a problem. But um, you know, we've got the, the speaker and the Senate president on a, on a positive note. You know, have really focused on sea level rise and climate change and resiliency from the speaker, uh, the Senate president on water quality and, and wastewater and sewer improvements. I think those are po you know certainly positive. I, I ran into the commissioner of education two days ago <clears throat> after hours. Um, you know, he's, he's, I think he's, he's chafing a little bit over the FSU presidency issue, uh, but, um, and that may not be over, but um, he, uh, you know, I, I think he's going to continue to push for um, his agenda and the governor's agenda. It is a campaign year. Um, I, I think uh, 2022, uh, you all see it, you know it. I mean, it's remarkable that Governor DeSantis is probably doing two press conferences a day. You know, he's all over the state. He's really never in town. Um, and that's just going to continue to gear up. And um, I think um, uh, he, will, he will track probably a little closer to the former president's agenda um, as, uh, as, uh, as that core group of supporters, um, you know, uh, is, is really in their in their, in their sights for uh, winning the 22 election. Um, we have some candidates coming out. So it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be unfortunately, if it could possibly be more partisan, um, uh, but I think it will be. Hopefully the election stuff is over. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, uh, with, with these bills, but uh, you, know, you, never, you, you never hope too much, so. Right. All right, anybody- So we'll any be having you, Trish. The key is Trish will be able to go to committee meetings in person. Yeah. Right? yeah. In the cabinet. You know, wasn't it interesting that, um, that the whole state was opened up um, just right after session ended? I know. Yeah, I went over to the uh, gaming committee uh, hearing uh, two days ago. Uh, no masks, uh, wide open. It's like nothing ever happened. It was, it was remarkable, so. Um, we shall see. So is the Capitol open now? It is. <clears throat> giving tours and everything. Well, Dan, do you have anything you'd like to say? Um, unmute. Let me see if I can unmute you. <laughs> and no, I don't have anything particular to add. I uh, am curious as to whether if when we're back in the Capitol again next year, next session, whether um, uh, the lobby corps will be needed to, you know, attend meetings, whether we'll go back to um, the filing reports for the board and the issue chairs and, and the rest. Of, I just wondered there was no way that could be done this year. It was out of the question, you know. Right, right. 
Um, I, I do see us going back to um, something very similar to the way that we operated before. Um, I, it's probably going to be a bit of a hybrid. I know I'm going to love having some other folks who can come and, um, and testify or at least be my partner in crime and, and you know, and sit there with me. Um, I think one of the things that the um, that happened because um, I couldn't be too many places at once. Lauren was absolutely fantastic. She filled in. Um, Mita filled in. Mita filled in. Yeah, she was. Yes, a- and um, I'm trying to think if Kathy Wynn, I can't remember now if, if Kathy Kathy uh, sat in. Sally, did you were you able to attend any of the meetings this year? I- I, I listened in and wrote some reports. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that there is so an, a- um, it, it was interesting because what it meant was the issue chairs had to be more on top of what was going yeah. on in the committee meetings. And I think that they found <laughs> that it was a benefit to do that, maybe even a little more so than, than reading a report, you know, having yeah. to actually be there. Now, I'm sure for some of them, um, it, it was challenging um, to stay on top of, of all the different bills that were part of their, their issue. That's why I'm saying we may wanna do something that's a little bit of a modified what, what we did before, but uh, I'm really looking forward to getting, getting back together with, with all of Lobby Corps and you know, just spending some time with everybody and chatting about um, the upcoming session, so. You know, I'll say I'll say one more thing. I, I think that there is an advantage to while it's see it's it's theater in a sense to having all these various people from the league with their great big buttons on going to committee meetings, sitting there, taking notes, even if it's for their own benefit. Right. right. Um, it makes us look like we're everywhere everywhere, you know, listening, watching, uh, reporting, that sort of thing. So that's an advantage, even though everyone doesn't testify, obviously. You know? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. I want to <laughs> ask Jeff and Lauren a question about conflicts of interest. And um, is there anything you think the league maybe should focus on next year to bring out sort of what I tried to do with Step Up for Students is to uh, bring to the public's attention some of these blatant conflicts like Richard Cochran that works for a charter school company right. or used to or his wife does and Manny Diaz who works for uh, Dorrell College and he's pushing these vouchers that's gonna benefit um, his employer and there's so many examples of that, I think, that just they just look the other way. I mean, it, and it, I guess it's legal, but it, but what do you think? I mean, is that just like, it, it is what it is, just forget about it? Or is there anything the league can do about some of these conflicts like that? Well, I think, you know, doing, doing your due diligence and, 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 and you kind of um, expose him you know, is, is, is certainly helpful. I mean, the politics of embarrassment, you know, has its value. There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> you can ask Matt Gates that right now. Um, but, <clears throat> I'm, not sure he's, I'm not sure he's seen it yet, but uh, so I, I think, Sally, the, you know, if, if you um, really, we have great access to the Capitol Press Corps. I mean, you know, we talk to them all the time. That's one of the, one of the tools we use to to elevate issues, to, uh, to to kind of discuss issues, to 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 uh, move certain things in a certain direction, and you know we could, if you, we we can certainly place or get reporters to write those things, um, and some you know oftentimes they do, and you know you you get you get uh, a standard response from the, the member, but um, you know I think it's I think it's something you know we we you ought to do. We, we can certainly help with that. You know, I, let me, let me, can I just one more last thing on that in kind of a bigger picture? As, as Trish pointed out initially, and I know you all know this, many of the positions you take, you know, irritate or contrary to um, uh, leadership in, the, in, in certain parties, right? And 
you know, we've talked those things through with Patty and the team about, you know, how much do you want to piss these people off? What's the trade off? You know, what's, what's the return on, you know, your kind of political capital investment. Um, but, you know, and there are people who, you know, lobbyists in my profession who wouldn't represent the league because you, it's a, you, you just grate people sometimes the wrong way and it may impact my business. On the other hand, I believe conviction and principle is super important because you really do speak the truth. I mean, you have a particular perspective. <clears throat> so I think that's just, you know, that's the kind of ongoing discussion we have constantly. Um, sometimes there are grenades that are thrown. Maybe some shouldn't have been thrown. Maybe some should have been thrown harder. Uh, and, and the goal is what do you want to do to accomplish your objectives? And I think that's, you know, that's the great thing about the league. We've got a great brand, uh, we've got a great mission. Um, and it's not just about you, it's about the people of Florida. Uh, they're going to be cliche-ish, but, you know, what's more important than voting? <laughs> uh, well, so, and our, our mission is to defend democracy. And I, I think right. we take that very seriously. And all of these things, I mean, I, I really fear our democracy is at risk with what's going on. And I think we just need to speak out. And yes, we, we get, we piss them off, as you say. But we're not going to, you know, that, that's about all we have now is to be right. able to speak out. And hopefully people will listen. And I think everybody understands and doesn't like unfairness, you know, injustice. And they don't like getting ripped off. And when they see some of these politicians, especially with these conflicts that are benefiting uh, behind the scenes, you know, that's not something the public can support. So, and I notice I, I have, this is kind of a side with this new gambling thing. Isn't that interesting that they're gonna create this commission made up of legislators making $138,000 or something for this little commission job and they remove the requirement that they had to wait two years after they leave. So they just set themselves up for these little cushy jobs. And, um, you yeah. know, they, they just keep doing it and every, they get away with it. Yeah. yeah. It's not right. Yeah. You know, Sally, you're right. <clears throat> Listen, they're not all like that. You know, for a long, no, they're not. That's true. Long stretch. And, <clears throat> and we, they're just like the kind of the bell curve. There are good ones. There are most of them in the middle are pretty good you know, on the edges on both sides. They, you know, there are different kind of extremes that, that play out in different ways. So, but you're right. When 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 those issues are are evident, uh, you need to you need to speak about them. And it is democracy, and it is fairness, and it is justice. So I think um, we got to just kind of kind of keep it up. Well, so we're here to you, help. Make, you make a good point, and I think you know we need to do be better at finding the good guys and the good gals and really supporting them too, because yeah. they're lonely. They're really lonely. The good one's trying to do the right thing. And um, so we need to support them more. So I think we'll need your help to point yeah. them out for us so we can get behind them and show them they're not alone trying to do the right thing. All right, so our time is up and um, Jeff and Lauren, I so wanna thank you for taking your time to um, to educate us a little bit more about what happened. Some of us lived through it, but you know, it's always better to uh, take, a, take a look uh, far away from the forest and look in at it. So Sally, I'm gonna turn it back to you for any final, final well, comments. Just to thank you so much to um, Jeff and Lauren and thank you for all the work you do for the league. And again, thanks to Trish for being our war horse out there and taking the slings and arrows on our behalf. And um, we thank you all for attending tonight. And if any of you are not league members yet, we welcome you, you know, men as well as women are welcome in the league. So um, come join us, lwvtallahassee.org is our website. This meeting will be recorded and put on our website so you can tell your friends about it. And I believe Jeff and Lauren are speaking again tomorrow at noon for the State League the oh, Lunch yeah. and Learn series. So we're putting them to work, that's for sure. But we're, we're, we're on tour. <laughs> <laughs> like a book tour. Well, anyway, <laughs> thanks everybody for being here. We'll thanks, Allie. say goodbye for the, have a nice summer. We won't do another Hot Topics till September. So enjoy yourselves and get off to the beach, Jeff. Bye. Right, thank you. <laughs>